Him. If you are grateful for just the opportunity of living, lift your voice and bless Him in this place tonight. If you are truly grateful for the things that God has been doing in your life, then you really don't need me to tell you to bless Him. If you are excited for what God is about to do in your life, then thank Him in advance. If you appreciate the very day that you have experienced from the hand of God, somebody open up your mouth and begin to bless Him. Uh, if we can just say like David, let everything in this place bless the Lord. You don't have all what you should have and you didn't go where you should have gone, but you have what God has allowed you to have. Lift up your voice in the sanctuary of Zion, ye people and children of Zion, and bless him in this house tonight. If you know the goodness of God, then why don't you celebrate what you know? You don't need somebody to help you celebrate him when you've met him, when you know him, when you understand his goodness. People of the living God, lift your voice and shout out to him with the voice of triumph. Hallelujah. Just before you take your seats, let me just quickly do protocol. Amen. Because I know if I move any further, I will lose my manners. And it's not that I don't have any, but I do. Bishop Williams, my good friend, God bless you to see you tonight. Always good to see you. Bishop, God bless you. New Jersey or New York? Bronx. All right. Well, still New York. God bless you. Good to see you. God bless you, Pastor. God bless you, men of God. The apostle is in the house. Amen. Elder, men and women of God, mother, bless you. Young people of Abiza, God bless you. Thank you for the invitation. I will not bore you tonight, but we're co we've come to bless in the name of the Lord. Somebody put your hands together and bless God. One of the things that I am sure that you will agree with me on tonight is that every single day we are challenged by the enemy. I got one amen. Every single day you get out of your bed, the devil is out to destroy you. Come on, somebody. Every move you make, it's like the enemy has got you on his GPS. And every turn you turn, it's like he's got an assassination. There's a, there's a warrant for, out for your arrest. He's got, he's got his wife, he's got his cousin, he's got his aunt, and he's got legions seeking to destroy you. But tonight, I wonder for the next few moments, if we can launch a spiritual attack against the enemy. Your theme is talking about an anointing. And if you're not anointed, you can't rebuke demons. You can shout all you want, but that won't let the devil run. Can we launch a spiritual attack tonight against the enemy? Can we, Abiza, launch an apostolic attack against the enemy with our worship? Sister Opal, we have found the problem. We activate more out of the flesh than we do out of the spirit. Then we wonder why we are not able to do what we say we've been anointed and appointed to do. Ladies and gentlemen, let me let you know, let me serve you notice tonight. If you don't know how to access your anointing, God help you. If you buck upon demons down a dark alley. You don't need to be saved to know how to shout. You don't have to have 20 years in church to know how to shout. The devil is not afraid of your shout. He's not afraid of how well you can pray. But what he's afraid of is when you go into worship because he knows. He knows. He knows. He knows that any time you get into the heavenlies of God, it's a different ball game. Is there anybody in this room tonight? Woo! 
may be seated. You may be seated. Take me down to G. You may be seated. Jesus. Somebody shout Jesus. I wish I had two people in this house that knew what the anointing was just to go beyond the gates. I know you don't feel well. I know you're a little bit tired. I know you're a little bit frustrated. But a man that is born of a woman is full of few days. And then those days are full of trouble. But in the midst of my trouble, can you find your anointing? Can you find? You want to frustrate somebody when they come to church who didn't come to church for church reasons? You begin to worship. You want to frustrate that spirit that lingers in the atmosphere? You begin to worship. You want the devil that showed up to church before you did get upset in the midst of service? Then you begin to worship. You want to mess up the very plan of the enemy? You begin to worship. I enjoyed the theme when I received the email and he spoke about the, I never did, I never did see the, the appointed part, but I only captured the anointing because I do believe there's many folks in church that they're only anointed to talk. That's the only anointing that they have. They couldn't run a demon, they couldn't run a dog, they couldn't even swat a fly but they got a good talk in their mouth. And in the midst of that good talk, all they do is just talk. They don't know how to pray. They don't know how to fast. They can barely sing a good song. They don't even know where Genesis chapter one is, but they have confused and they have believed, they believe in their mind that they have confused people in the church. But I'm here to serve somebody notice that guess what? You haven't fooled me. Because I've seen a lot of people come into church. They've jumped higher than me. They've shouted louder than me. They've run faster than me. They, they know the scriptures better than me. But they have no God in them because they're nowhere to be found. Oh, come on, somebody. You, 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 you might as well loosen up tonight because we're going we're gonna to see if we can have a good time tonight. But we're also going to be real. There's a lot of stuff that's in church, Apostle Samuels. It ain't of God. God has never signed off on it. He's never sanctioned it. Gabriel, Raphael, and Michael, the archangel, wasn't even informed about what we do in church half the time. And sometimes the reason why it takes so long for us to get to where we need to go to is because we've got too much flesh in the church. There's too much flesh trying to sing under the anointing. There's too much flesh on the usher board. There's too much flesh in the deacon board. We've got a whole lot of ideas, but we have no anointing. And what happens is, we spend so much time calling the church to all night prayer. Nine days of fasting. 46 days of fasting. But the problem is there's too much flesh operating in the church. And you get no results. How do you go on fasting for 40 days and come out the same way? Something is wrong. How do you read your word and you don't live a better lifestyle? Something is wrong. Do me a favor, just bring me into G. The only reason I'm asking him to do that because I'm a little bit too high in my pitch and I don't want to throw my back out tonight. Thank you. All right, I'm, all right. 
I didn't lose what I came with. I still got it. I just want to make sure I'm rightly pitched so I don't hurt myself tonight. All right, you understand what I'm saying, Bishop? Thank you very much. Somebody in this house understands me. Amen. There's too much of the flesh in the way. But then we're asking God to perform miracles. Then we say, then why isn't the church the way it used to be? I remember back in the day. How come we don't see these things? I remember, and forgive me, I'm not here to hit anybody, but just work with me. Most of, you, most of us in here from where? Thank you, Bishop. So if I, if I mention Jamaica, don't get upset because 99.9% .9 of you are from Jamaica. I'm from England, just for, for the record's sake. So we say when we were in Jamaica, we used to do this. Hello, somebody. When we were in Jamaica, we used to do and we used to see and we used to hear but what has happened is somewhere along the line flesh got in the way so we blame the musician we blame the usher we blame the choir but we forgot to blame ourselves so when we when we stir up the flesh, I'm going to read the text because I, I, I do want to read it, but I just want to paint the canvas if you don't mind. So when we spend so much time on the flesh, and when the flesh can't get its way, then we begin to fight each other. And when we begin to fight each other, we then make it become a silly warfare. So when we have testimony services, instead of testifying of the goodness of God, we're throwing ballistic missiles at each other. We're sending scud missiles at each other. And then we finish after that saying, I'm on my way to glory land. And the problem is, there's so much of me in the midst that even if God wanted to come in, he can't find his way in the house because there's too much flesh in the house. So what happens is we create what I would call a buzz, a cocaine high, because now it's time to feel the presence of God. But ladies and gentlemen, can I serve you notice that you don't need to try to feel the presence of God because the presence of God will never leave you once it's always the predominant force in your life. Hello, somebody. If you feed something, it must grow. Hello. If you feed a pig, it will become fat. It moves from a pig to a hog. Forgive me. If you feed a chicken, it will produce more meat on its body. If you feed a cow, it'll get a better milk. If you feed a child of God, it must be more anointed. It must have an anointing. It's not about your tongues. It's not about what you can do, but it's about what God will allow you to do. So I enjoy the theme. I don't know who chose it, and I'm not concerned. Though. But when I read the thought and I read the text, this is up my alley. Because too long we're in the church, and we keep saying the Moravian, the Anglican, the Methodist, the Baptist, the Jehovah Wickedness. We keep calling their names about what they're doing, and we say they have no anointing, but yet we, the tongue-talking church, we can't even rebuke an ant. Because we spend so much time criticizing everybody else. When you're anointed, you don't care what nobody else is doing. When you're anointed, you know what God has called you to do. I have always been blessed by this house. I remember years ago, when I first, well not when I first came, but when I came, and I, re I made reference to this when I was here doing the workshop that I think they're still there, the two hospital signs. They're still there? They're still there. I made reference to it because it's interesting that in a church you will find a hospital logo. But that is the best place for you to find it. Because this is the place where people come to get healed and delivered. Hello somebody. When you're sick, you don't need a Tylenol. You just need laying on of hands to set you free. When you're bind up in sin, and trust me, we got a whole lot of tongue-talking folk still wrapped up and bound up in sin. 
but because we don't have satellite dish tracking everybody and we don't have the telescope not a telescope but we don't have devices being able to watch everybody persons feel that they can do whatever they want to do whenever they want to do it and however they want to do it and come into church and then put on you can't put on the anointing no baby it's got to be in you You've got to live the lifestyle of an anointed vessel. You can't, when you get here, saying, well, I'm going to shout the service down. You can shout all you want to shout, but that doesn't mean God showed up in the house. Many a times, can I say this, Sister Nicole? Many a times we come to church, nobody else shows up. The devil don't show up and God don't even show because he knows what you're already going to do. He's already got you mapped out. He's already got you figured out. He knows what song you're going to sing. He know who going to moderate the service. He know who going to get up and test the lie. He know who going to get up and throw a stone. He even knows how much you're going to drop in the offering plate. The devil half the time don't even show up in our services because he's got us so confused that it doesn't matter anymore. So he knows that I hate you. But because you don't have the wherewithal to tell me to sit down I hate him he hates me but yet we will he will invite me into the pulpit he will say come testify brother Griffiths and I testify at the greatness of his his efforts and his achievement but you know as well as I do I can't stand a man hello somebody I'm getting to the anointed part I'm just laying a little foundation here officer there's too much of us in the house. There's so much of us that half the time you can't see God. What you see is culture. What you see is a system. What you see, can I say it, is politics. But you don't see God. If we want to see God, I got to change me. So if you don't mind, let us go to the text. You will find me in the book of St. John's, chapter number 14. And I'm reading from your theme. I love this. You are anointed. I'm not too worried about the appointed part. Because if you are anointed, you got to do something. I'm challenged in my own world. That when people say, they don't ask me to do nothing. Well, if somebody don't ask you to do something, then why don't you ask, what can I do? What will thou have me to do? And I found out many people don't want to do nothing in church without a hidden agenda and when their agenda has not been satisfied they criticize the very thing that should be a blessing to somebody else if what you're doing is not benefiting nobody else I'm not gonna tell you the path well it better you say because you're the bishop <laughs> because our objective ladies and gentlemen is for somebody else the life we live is not so, and I said this at church on Sunday, and I said, I know some of you are going to throw me out, but the life we live shouldn't be to go to heaven. The life we live should be pleasing that somebody else can see the life of Christ in you and ask the question, what must I do to become like you? Too many of us, we pack up ready to go to heaven, but we haven't done anything to bless somebody else. I'm dying to go to heaven. Well, you haven't done anything on earth. How do you know you're going to heaven? So, let us hear what the writer says. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he also and greater works than 
these shall he do because I go unto my father and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name that will I do that the father may be glorified I tell you I feel something in my 160 pound flesh right about now my God can I just stay right here just for a few minutes and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name that will I do if I was to preach a message tonight I would speak to you from the subject that will I do that will I do it is interesting that when we go back to the book of Genesis we find God doing everything isn't that interesting he does not have a council meeting he does not make reference to any angelic being he does not have discourse with anyone to suggest how things should be put in place but God shows us and he demonstrates us to us the the activity of his voice there's something about what is inside of you called your voice and God shows us the ability that when we speak things must happen I enjoy what he said and God said let there be and there was and we begin to go through scripture and I believe in the second chapter this is what makes me puzzled in my thinking he didn't say and let there be man God formed man from the dust of the ground and for you theologians and for you persons that are a student in the scripture you should have asked yourself the question why is it that he didn't call man into existence that's something for you to go home and ponder about he called everything into existence but man hmm. there's something about when you create something from nothing there's something about when your hand touches something there is a glory that is departed from you that is a, now a reflection of you that has been pulled from the dust of the ground that's why I wonder when folks are in church and they say I can't find nothing to do because your glory cannot be revealed I know you, uh, you, 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 it'll come to you in a couple of days anytime you touch something such as that keyboard the extension of God's presence has been revealed through you through your playing anytime you lay hands on the sick and they recover it is an extension of God's glory vehicling through you so God does not call man from the dust of the ground he forms man forms him and I can just imagine if you go to Vogue or Ebony there's some good-looking men in those magazines but none of them can top what Adam looked like somebody say amen. amen because God does not make anything ugly hello somebody why do you think the scripture declared that he will beautify the meek so there's some ugly folks that have come to church through sin because sin makes us ugly you might not like that but baby you might as well you might as well receive it sin made such ugly so the more we use ugliness to decorate ugliness it cannot be beautiful but until you conform to the things of God he said I'll beautify you that's why that's why certain females they don't need to wear makeup because the glory of God's beauty is upon them uh, you don't need eyeliner you don't need Revlon or Maybelline uh, you don't need you don't need you don't need you don't need because the beauty of God's glory has been revealed through you I, I'm not here to talk about Revlon but I'm just letting somebody know that you don't need all of that stuff because God's beauty he will take anything and make them look good somebody say amen if you believe me 
so he, we, we see it in Genesis where he's now forming man in dust of the ground and he breathes in him himself the breath of life, breath of life. He, can you imagine God breathes himself into man that man becomes, man becomes living uh, to the point where he can commune with God, relation with God, uh, uh, conversations I can just imagine were just so profound that can you imagine constantly having this kind of dialogue with God, that kind of relationship where there's nothing impeding or hindering your communication with God. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I'm fast-tracking here, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the devil shows up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, can I say something? And I'm just going to digress for a moment. The devil will show up in the best of your services. Hello, somebody. He will come in in a subtle way and he will play like he knows the word of God because to some degree he does. So now he speaks to the woman and they have friendly conversation and he declares a few things and after he's declared it, then we're going to take from the tree. We know the story. I hope we know the story. And he, she hands off and they participate. And all of a sudden now man has fallen. So the relationship that Adam once had with God is no longer the same. To the point where he now recognizes that something went wrong. I, I, I'm, I'm heading to the text, but just bear with me. I, I'm just going to stay in Genesis chapter number 2 just, just for, for, for a few moments. So he recognizes that something is wrong. And I've always asked the question, what would provoke him to think that something went wrong? So it tells me that mankind has a conscience above and beyond what we think we've got. Yes, that's right. Many of you know if you smoke a spliff, and for those of you that don't know what that is, it's a marijuana or marijuana, according to the Canadian. Or for those of you from the Caribbean, a ganja. So let's stick to the crib, if you don't mind. Many of us in here know you don't need Hebrews to tell you you don't need to smoke a spliff. You don't need a prophet to come prophesy to you that you need to put down that blunt. Hello. You don't need somebody to prophetically speak to you and tell you that the slander that you're doing against your brother, that it's wrong. Hello, somebody. There is something called my conscience that speaks to my flesh and say it's wrong. But the problem is we have become so disobedient, not just to God, but even to our flesh, that we, we will spend more time destroying a man than we will hold, helping a man up. So it, it, it tells me then that Adam knew something was wrong. So he then goes and hides himself. Case in point, he hides himself. After he hides himself, he pulls a leaf from a live tree. He took a live tree leaf, separated it from the tree. So now, in a moment of time, if you will, that leaf is now dead. So he took a live leaf from a live tree and caused death upon the leaf to cover up death. Chew on that for a minute. So death covered death. I'm going somewhere. And he couldn't understand why he was in that predicament. So God had to remind him that I told you of every tree in the garden you can eat of. But this tree, don't touch it. So when God gives clear direction, somebody needs to listen. You don't need a second revelation from God to hear the first one right. So then now, man couldn't stay in the Garden of Eden. You've got a dead man in a live place. 
So now he has to be moved out of this garden. I'm coming to your text. And now God says, just to protect you from yourself, let me put angels blocking you from entering in. Because when you were in there, you didn't know how to handle it. So now that I've moved you out, I don't want any reason why you need to try to get back in. Because you might hurt yourself. Hmm. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me. Uh, where am I? Could you flash that on the screen? This, yeah. He that believeth on me, the works that I shall do, the works that, that I do shall he also do, Greater works shall you do. Flip to the next verse for me. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, here is where I am tonight. And then I'm almost done. Many of us have disobeyed God. And if I can boldly say, we have lost some glorified things that God has given us and we're operating outside of the will of God in flesh trying to conquer spiritual things and we're out here wandering in a wilderness of flesh many of us are frustrated and the reason why we're frustrated is because we're outside of the presence of God we're trying to find things to satisfy us, to get us into this spiritual high. I can never understand when people say, I want to get deeper in God. Well, no, you don't need to get deeper in God. Just have a relationship with him and let him do the rest. You, you, you don't need to try to know him better. Just re have a relationship with him. You talk to a boy or a girl long enough, you will know stuff about them that you would never have known before from a distance. So many of us are operating outside here. So what happens is when the presence of God comes into a beezer, and if you don't mind, you invited me, so I'm going to talk to a beezer. The rest of you all, you can take it home, if you will, as a snack pack, but tonight I'm talking to a beezer. When you abide outside the presence of God, Bishop Williams, what happens is when the glory of God comes in, anytime the glory of God comes in anywhere, it doesn't matter who you are, you're going to feel something. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the anointing that you're feeling. You're only feeling the mist of God's presence. You're only feeling the dew, the residue of God's presence. But what you need to feel is more than just a residue. Because what happens is when you leave the sanctuary, you're leaving to go out to do the same thing. Can I, su can I suggest to you that anybody that is anointed of God, the things that you did 30 years ago, ah, dare I say you don't even have the desire or the appetite to do it. Yeah, yeah I, I try to do good, but evil presents itself. It doesn't mean that you have to be subjected to evil, ladies and gentlemen. I do understand that the flesh has challenges. I also understand that there's spiritual wickedness in high places. I also understand that not everybody's going to like you. I also understand that not everything that you do, people are going to like. But if God has anointed you to do it, you don't need to argue with anybody. You don't need to fight with anybody. God does not need you to defend him. Let him defend himself and you do the work that he's called you to do. I never have to defend what I do because if I have to defend it that means I'm the one who's doing it and anytime God has given you a work to do you just do the work and let God do the rest ladies and gentlemen can I say something to you one of the things that we have not done and we don't do it very frequently in the church we don't open up our mouth and speak those things as though they be not we don't ask God in, we don't ask him for anything what we're asking him for is a better job well, we're asking him for more money. And believe me, I wouldn't mind it. But I'm not going to put that on my top 10 agenda. Because one thing I do know, my God is rich. My God can supply more than what I can ever imagine. So for me to ask God in prayer to pay a hydro bill, it is an insult to God.
you ask it in my name. If you're anointed, you don't need to ask God to double your anointed. I know you're going to go all the way back to the Old Testament, fine. But it ain't for you. You're a New Testament, no. You don't need to go back there and ask for a double portion. No. Work with the one that you got. It's more than enough. What, when was the last time that we've asked God to, to impact us and empower us to go out to reach people? When was the last time that we've asked God to empower our thinking that we go greater than where we were? That when we come, even before we get to church, we have a mind that somebody's going to be delivered. That we know every single Sunday somebody walks in here sick, whether it be physically, emotionally, psychologically, that we're asking God that the service, there's an atmosphere in the service whereby persons can be delivered in their mind. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot of people in church, they have lost their spiritual mind. They just got a good shout, but they've lost their spiritual mind. The faculties of their mind is gone. Ask him. Ask him to do some transferring in my mind. Years ago, and if you don't mind, I don't mind going back there. Years ago, when we used to come to church, I'll be 47 in two weeks. So I've been in Toronto for 1971. So it's been a little while that I've been here. And when we used to go to church, Mother Williams, it was important for somebody to receive the infilling of the Holy Ghost. It was important that travailing took place in Zion. It was important that souls were delivered. And I'm speaking to the young people because I know, you know we're growing and we're designing things. But it's, it's, l l hear me when I say this. And I'm not old and I'm not trying to be old school, but I'm just trying to be real. What people want to see is the Jesus that you get up out of your bed every single Sunday morning and come and shout about. They want to see that Jesus in your life. That's what they want to see. They don't, want, they don't want you to look like them, believe it or not. I have no problem in the way I look. None whatsoever. Call me cocky, call me full of myself. I feel good how I look. I don't need to look like the other guy. Become me and him and a friend. My neighbor should not, I should not buck up my neighbor in hell because he'll ask me, well, what have you been going to church all these years for? Hello, somebody. Hello, somebody. So we as young people, if we want to experience the anointing and the power of God in our lives, we have to draw away from the things of this world. We have to draw away literally from ourselves. We have to find out what God's desire is for my life. And when we have found it out, well, then we have to slowly begin to start to execute what God has given us to do. Many of us want to get to the end of the line, but we, to the beginning of the line, when we haven't even got in the line. The anointing is not to grandstand and show how powerful you are. The anointing is not to show how great the relationship is with God. Your anointing is to be demonstrated for the glory of God. So when people see you coming, they say, let me call Nicole, because she's got words that soothes my spirit. Can I get a witness here? When you go to work, when you go to school, my lifestyle should be so different that people want to know, what are you doing when you're not here? What are we doing? So it is incumbent upon me that I plunge further into God. Can I share something with you? And I'm almost done. If I was to ask the question, how many of us have experienced some hardship? Raise your hands. Play me out. Oh, probably about 80% of the church. Okay, so 80% of us have experienced hardship. But this is what bothers me. Paul has the nerve to call it light affliction. How could Paul conclude the Gehenna that I go through as light affliction? How could he say the judgment that I experience from day to day is light affliction? 
What gives him the green light to suggest that in his text? But I realized that what we experience is really a purging away of the flesh. You can't want to do great things and if you're broke for two months, you boycott God's house. You can't want to experience a level of greater works when you come to church one day a week for two and a half hours. In order for you to experience an anointing, ask yourself the question when you go home, am I emotionally driven in the service or am I really feeling the presence of God? You put on a Luther Vandross, a husband and wife, you put on a Luther Vandross, Teddy, Bendegra Teddy, Teddy Pendergrass or one of them guys, <clears throat> and some people just get all caught up in the musical moment. Can I get half a witness? I, I'm talking to the married folks now. <laughs> but if you don't need a Luther or a Teddy Pendergrass, you don't need to be emotionally driven by music. Because relationship will proceed in going forward. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to experience some profound things in the body of Christ. But many of us are not willing to go through. Well, oh Carlton, it's easy for you to say, if you've been through what I've been through, you will understand. Well, the problem is in our churches, everybody's classified themselves higher in their affliction. It's almost sometimes testimony services about who can, who can go through hell the best. That's what it sounds like sometimes. Oh, child, please, let me give you a testimony that will blow your mind. But we've lost the meaning of the text. If you want to do greater works, if you want to do great things, then the flesh has got to get out of the way. The great things that he's talking about is really reaching out and calling sinners to repentance. In this day and age, ladies and gentlemen, it's a tough task. But the greater works that we can do and we shall do, don't be concerned about raising the dead because that's a God plan. Don't be uh, so concerned about opening up a blinded eyes. That's a God plan. Our concern, my concern, should be am I available to function in the body of Christ? That's what my concern should be. I, 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 I call myself anointed, but am I really anointed? I, 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 I say that I have a gifting, but I, am I really gifted? Gifted folks, if they're never called, they don't have to worry because they know that they're operating on the platform of God. It doesn't matter how well you can sing. If they don't call you for six months, lay low. Lay low, because when God releases you back another six months, you will be a torpedo. That's when you're mature in God. You're not concerned about getting in the pulpit. You're concerned about God getting in you. I told a bishop the other day, I'm not offended if you don't call my name, because I already know my name. I already know my name. And I'm not the preacher for the night, so it doesn't matter whether I say anything. It's not important. I, I've realized I'm not the important guy in the room. I, it, it doesn't matter. I don't care if you call me Brother Griffiths. It, it doesn't matter to me because I'm realizing there are baptized in Jesus' name people that are sitting in this room that are going through hell and they need deliverance. Who cares who you are? Well, pe well, people won't come back if they don't know who the leader is. If they have an encounter with Jesus, they'll be back. 
if Jesus was in the room, they'll be back. If the anointing was in the room, they'll be back. If you never preached a message that Sunday morning, but the Holy Ghost has its free course, they'll be back. When you introduce a man or a woman to Christ, they will be back. By far, and I'm going to say something that might perplex some of you, but I'm saying this from the bottom of my heart. The only choir that I know that is still and always will be, and if I can go so far, that is amazingly anointed. Even when they're not anointed, they can still mess up a house. Is Abiza. And as good as they can sing, if they sing without the anointing, they'll bless the flesh. But when they sing under the anointing, they bless the entire man. There's too much of flesh in the house. We've exercised the flesh so much that we don't even need to go to the gym. But the spirit man is so badly out of shape that when the spirit man is needed to lay hands on the sick, We've become so diplomatic that we say you can't touch him because they might be offended. Well, that's fine. I don't need to touch you when I'm anointed. I speak the word. I'm all for order. And I'm all for discipline. I'm all for a lot of things. But one thing I'm more concerned about is that the presence of God is in the house. Don't tell me where I got to go to find out how to lay hands. I got to go to a workshop or I got to go to a seminar. No, 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 no. The devil is alive. Come here quickly. Come here, sweetheart. The problem is we have, we have taught ourselves so much stuff. Say right there. We have taught ourselves so much stuff that when come time to put things into practice, there is no anointing. There is no power. You're lucky if you can get tongues out of it because we have become so systematic in our operation that we've left God out of the picture that even if he wanted to bless her, we have to go through our protocol. But when this young lady comes to the altar and I say, can I get two missionaries to come and pray with her? We walk like we're going to a funeral service. Like she got all night to wait on you to come and lay hands. That ain't no anointing. That's no anointing. And then when you come up here now, you can't let her go. Hello, somebody. I didn't mean to mess up your youth service. But we can't let her go because there's a spirit on her. Well, if you knew that from when you were down there, you would have got up here sooner. She don't have all night to wrestle with you. So come time now to lay hands on her in the name of Jesus. Sometimes, most of the time, I try my best not to lay hands. Because I'm thinking nowadays, sometimes, and, and forgive me for being so bold, sometimes people, some, and because I'm a male, I have to be wise in what I do. Because some people, the only way they can get close to you, because after church, I kind of hang around with certain people just to make sure, because men are blind, men have eyes. So I make sure, huh? Because you know, you know, some people, they don't want healing. They don't want prayer. They just want to get close. You are too saved. You're too saved. Let me finish, let me finish, let me finish, let me finish, let me finish. So when the anointing of God is in the house, when the anointing of God is in the house, and the presence of God has saturated the house, it's not important anymore who does what. It's not important of how it gets done but God will use a vessel. If you raise the dead next week, Sunday, don't call yourself a dead raiser. You're still sheep. He's the shepherd. He may never raise a dead as long as he pastors this house. 
But if God should ask you to lay hands on the dead and you raise them, next week Sunday, as a matter of fact, when they pronounce the benediction and going forward, you're still sheep. But what happens is we have become so self-grandulized that we take the glory of God for ourselves. Well, the brother would never have received the Holy Ghost if I didn't lay hands on him. The devil is a liar. We got so much glory takers in the house of God, sometimes I wonder if God is not offended. So when you ask the people of God to lift their hands and praise Him, it's hard to do that because there's so much flesh in the room. There's no greater works because I have not prepared myself. My faith, ask yourself the question, when was the last time you challenged yourself to true faith? Or take out the truth, just faith on its own, merit. We don't really believe God anymore. We really don't. We don't need to believe God for money because we have my partner draw. We, we, we don't need to believe God anymore because I can borrow it from my friend. We don't need to believe God anymore because I've got a line of credit that I can pull from. We, 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 we've, we've somehow fallen away and we're living outside the gates trying to access the things within the gate. I'm going to challenge each and every one of you young people in here tonight. I want to challenge you that when you leave here tonight, you don't have to, but I challenge you because I know it works. Let me give you the testimony before I challenge you. A few months ago, you wouldn't know this, but I, I haven't been working for almost two and a half years. I got mortgage, wife, children, a ridiculous car payment. I mean ridiculous. I was stupid for signing the deal, but that's, I was operating in the flesh when I did that one. <laughs> You got hydro, you got gas, you got, you have, you have, and you have. And here's the part, my wife wasn't working either. So you got C getting up, looking at, Christine looking in my face, and me looking in her face. And it got to the point, Sister Nicole, where I was, I was, I was disappointed on a few levels. And the saints, every now and then, keep saying, well, this is what God wants for you. And my response to them was, I ain't deaf. So if this is what God wants, he never told me. I'm not trying to use me being unemployed, that, trying to say that God's trying to lead me into ministry. I'll leave that for the other guy, but not for me. Because again, he and I don't have malice, so I'm not sure why he wouldn't be able to say, this is where and the direction I want you to go in. Hello, talk to me somebody. So I heard what they said. And I had a conversation with God. It wasn't a prayer. And I said, God, <clears throat> I find it a little challenging to read your word. And I said, oh, you ask me why? I said, because I'm operating out of your word. I'm not operating in your word. I'm operating out of it. And he didn't say why, but I said, oh, so you asked me why. Well, even though you told Adam, by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, I said, the problem is my face ain't sweating, so I'm not sure how I'm going to eat bread. So I understand that you're trying to extend my faith, but I need you to help balance me out. This is the conversation I'm having. If I was single, more than likely it wouldn't really bother me so much because... You know, it's just you, yourself, and you. You have a hot dog, you go to your bed in a cup of hot water. Hello, for those of you from Jamaica know what I'm talking about. ex the hot dog. Hello. I'm trying to strengthen your mind. And then I, 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 I you know, and then Chris every now and then, she'll say things to kind of, you know, make you feel a little good. But you know what was interesting? Every single week when I went to church, I didn't bellyache. 
I didn't tell the church that I wasn't working. I didn't get up and testify. I didn't find a message to preach on something to make me feel good. Because I realized it's really not the plan of the enemy. It's really the plan of God. The problem is we blame the devil for the stuff God is doing. That's a hard one to swallow. We blame the devil for stuff God is doing. Because if you're going to come out as pure gold, I'm not sure how the devil's going to help you come out as pure gold. If you understand the train of thought. So then, one Mother's Day, last year, Mother's Day, I woke up, Bishop, getting ready. We're having a uh, joint service with the Spanish ministry. And I said, God, I don't have to tell you what's in the bank. You already know. I said, you need to fix this because I can't do a thing. Went to church, ministered the Sunday, and I said to the church, which I'm going to ask you to do shortly, I said, can we forget about everything and just go to God in a free worship? I said, for some reason, I feel like God is going to give somebody something, and I don't know who. I said, it could be me, but I don't know who. But I just need us to free up the very natural atmosphere that we're in. After church, I, I, I changed my robe and I put on my jeans because we were serving for Mother's Day. And a sister came up to me and she says, I need to talk to you. But she was very aggressive, like I did to her something. A big woman. Or an ageable woman. <laughs> so it's customary that we take them into the back, Sister Nicole. And I walked in and she said to me, you chat too much. And I said, really? I said, come again. You chat too much. <laughs> so I pulled out one of the chairs and I sat down and I thought, okay, another one of the sanified folk coming to tell me off. <laughs> so I said, well, how can I help you? And she opened up her bag <clears throat> and I thought, well, she don't look like the gun type. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hello. We got a lot of mental health issues in church and we just shout it out like we're washing clothes. But we got a lot of mental issues in Zion. Oh, yes, we do. Oh, yes, we do. Maybe not here at Ebenezer, but we got them in church. And she was digging through her bag. And I said to her, I said, whatever's troubling you, it's okay. She goes, no, no, you chat too much. And I said, you know what? I'm kind of getting tired of you telling me to chat too much. What exactly are you trying not to say? And she said, every single time you open your mouth in this place, the word of God comes through my house in such a way. And three weeks ago, she, she said that something told me. I said, well, what did it tell you? And she didn't say. And she pulled out a, a kyla. What I mean a kyle or a coil. <laughs> of money. And I said, wait a minute, did God tell you or Lucifer? She goes, Lucifer wouldn't tell me to do this. So I said, all right. And I pulled back the chair and I sat there. So I said, oh, you want to bless the ministry? She says, no, I, I need to bless you. So I said, well, now I'm thinking the conversation I had with God in the morning. This woman gave me $1,000. When I walked out the office and I hugged her, when I walked through the administrative doors and I opened the doors to let her go, another sister grabbed me and said, hey, we need to talk to you. I said, it's Mother's Day. I, I need to deal with the mothers. She go, no, 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 this won't take too long. And she said, take this. So I just put it in one pocket. Somebody called me outside and I went to go see them. And I said, like, I got to deal with the mothers. Another sister grabbed me, big woman, not, not you know, 
she grabbed me. She said, here, God, tell me if you put this in your hand. I went outside to get something out of the car, and her sister said, the Holy Ghost, I'm not lying to you. She said, the Holy Ghost, tell me if you drop this in your spirit. By the time I got home, ladies and gentlemen, this pocket was full. This pocket, because I didn't want to mix up the money. <laughs> This pocket was full. This pocket was full. And this one was full. And when I went home, I said to Chris, I said, guess me what? <laughs> she goes, what? You wouldn't believe what happened. She said, shut your mouth. May I have to tell you something. <laughs> so I said, what? She, got me, she said, she told me not to tell you and I can't tell you. So I said, it's okay, I won't die. What is it? She said, look what she gave me. $500. By the time I emptied the pockets, we were nearing $3,000. I left the money, hear me now, and I'm talking to the young folk because a lot of you don't got faith. You got a good shout, but you don't have no faith. Hello? Mothers, say hello. And when we laid the money on the bed, well, I said to her, I just want you to do one thing. Just say it one time. Don't get carried away, because if you get carried away, your emotions will get in the way. I said, I just need you to say one time, God, I thank you for these blessings. Just one time. And I said, clear up the bed. It's time to go to bed. Ladies and gentlemen, youth from Ibiza, if you're so concerned about what people think and how you function, you're not ready for the next level. Because that's your flesh talking, not your anointing. If you're so concerned whether or not you did it right, that's not the anointing. If you're worried about how you look and how you sound, and how you feel, then it's not the anointing. Because the interesting thing about the anointing, it will ask you to do stuff that's not favorable to that house. Because sometimes God will use you to put the crooked way straight. And some folk, believe it or not, they love to see the church in a mess. Bishop Williams, some folk love when you come to church and carry on week after week. They enjoy it because the spirit of the flesh loves warfare. They love to hear the bickering and the fighting. Oh yeah, they went down in Jesus' name and I believe they did receive the infilling of the Holy Ghost, but they got removed out of the garden of God and they believe they're still operating under the power of God and they feel that they know more than everybody else. They've been moved out of the presence of God. That's why anything that they do, confusion comes out of it. How could you run testimony service and end it in confusion? How could you end a worship service and there's fighting at the end of service? The devil is a liar. That's not God. People are more interested in trying to destroy you. Sticks and stones may break my bones. Yes, they do, but words will never hurt. That's a lie. They do hurt. They do hurt. But this is where I've become more mature in my thinking. You can talk about me all you want. That's fine. But at the end of the day, you now butter my bread. When I'm sick, you're not there to heal me. When I'm broke, you're not there to provide for me. When I don't know which way I'm going, you're not there to assist me. I know the God that I serve. I really don't need you. People want you to get all worked up because they want to see the flesh. Oh, you think you're so saved? 
oh, I'm going to make him cuss today before he go home. No, you're not going to make me cuss because the devil will not rise up in me because I recognize and I know that some come for strife and some come for debate. But I come in the name of the Lord because when I enter into those gates, I come to be a blessing to somebody. I work in an environment every single day every other day somebody's dying I left my phone in the car because while I'm in service in praise worship they're sending me a text message to tell me so-and-so died I'm in the pulpit I feel the phone vibrating that means somebody just died and ever since I've been in this role I'm realizing how important life is I'm realizing just because I might be 46, I could die tomorrow. You could be 28, you could be 31, you could be 26, you could be 18 years old. You don't have nothing that can hold you back from the cold and chilly hands of death. Just because you're young, oh, I've got, I, oh, I'm going to live to 95. You're lucky if you live four more weeks. And I'm realizing more and more, not everybody in this day and age really means church. I'm realizing, and forgive me for offending somebody right here, but I'm realizing the longer folks have been in church is the more confusion they create. It's at the point where some people don't want people to be saved. They have no desire for people to be filled. It doesn't matter to them if the church mortgage is not paid. They could care less if the altar yields of its fruit. Do you see the warfare that we fight when we even just come to church just to have church? Half the time, I believe in my own self, I believe that the world has nothing to do with what we do in here. We in here fighting against each other. We've created our own vacuum whereby we cannot even release our own selves. And here's the problem. Believe it or not, somebody's sitting in this church that would have loved to die a couple of weeks ago. But we don't know. There's many people in church that are extremely lonely on various levels, but we don't know. The church is the only thing that they have keeping them afloat. But I throw a hand grenade over there because I don't like her in testimony, sir. The church is the only medium whereby we can express ourselves in praise and worship. The church is the only place where we have liberty and freedom to glorify a God that we cannot see. The church is the only place where we have been given power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon us. Many of us have low self-esteem, but thanks be to God for the Holy Ghost that when the Spirit of God moves upon us, oh good God Almighty, but yet we come and we fight an unproductive warfare. There's people that are sitting in this church. They're struggling on various levels. There's people that are sitting in this room that are struggling on many levels. It's easy to tell a man don't fornicate or don't adul uh, commit adultery. But it's easy for you to say because you're going home to your wife and your husband. There's people that are struggling on various levels. But when we come to church, iron should sharpen an iron. But the problem is we're not sharpening each other. We're cussing out each other. We're fighting over things that have no profit to no man. If we're not careful, we come to church just to see who we can tear down today. But we want to experience the anointing of God. Can we somehow get back to this hospital place where on a Sunday morning we're performing spiritual surgery? Good God Almighty, I feel something in here. 
Can we, can, 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 can we get to the place where somebody comes in and you don't have to be an elder, you don't have to be a deacon, you don't have to be an evangelist. All you have to do is have the power of the anointing and the Holy Ghost on your life. And during a testimony service, you feel depression on the sister. You just walk over to her and say, in the name of Jesus, depression, I cast you out. In the name of Jesus, you don't have to disrupt the service. Can we go back to when we were a hospital where it was more nurturing and more caring and it was more kindness and more consideration where we allowed what God has given us to permeate the room and saturate the room. Can we go back to the place, and I'm not just talking a beezer, I'm speaking to everybody in here. Can we go back to that place where when we came into church, there was, a, there was a freeness about us that even if you know somebody didn't like you for whatever reason, you didn't have no problem in hugging them and say, God bless you. You weren't interested in keeping malice. Because you, you, you see the problem, the, the thing with the anointing, it matures you in the flesh. It mature, it helps you to grow in the flesh. Uh, you, you, you're not interested in, again I, I tell I, and I'm not trying to be cocky but I really don't care what people have to think about me it, it doesn't bother me anymore it used to when I was younger but I, I, let me grow up no I'm big enough now to realize that if you do good they don't like you if you say good they don't like you if you sing good they don't like you you sing bad names laugh after you it doesn't matter what you do so you might as well just do what God has called you to do There's such an atmosphere in this room. Somebody needs healing in their spirit. There's so much scars in the church. There's more scars in the body of Christ than there was on Jesus' back. There's so many persons that have been torn in various ways because of things that they weren't even aware of, that they've been abused in their spirit, in their mind. They've been beaten down on, not by the world, but by the... And mind you, I'm not, I don't want anybody leaving here thinking I'm bashing the church. I'm not bashing, you cannot, I'm not talking the church of the living God. I'm talking the, the house, if you will. The, the problem is, there's too many, there's so much tears, and it's not tears of joy. It's tears of sorrow. It's hard for us to pray because, it's, because there's so much weight that you're confused whether or not I should stay because, or should I leave, or I, I can't take it anymore. It's, I, Pressure is killing me. I can't sleep. I can't function. I, 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 I can't even have a relationship with God because there's so much destruction that is creating the problem. And God, I don't want to leave you. God, I love you. But I can't take. Frustration in your spirit. You're fighting just to get a breakthrough. You're pulling hard just to say hallelujah. So what happens now, the very words out of our mouth become non-effective. I can't command things anymore. I can't speak and things happen anymore because I've been so withered away. Shall we all stand? I didn't mean to turn you down a different road tonight. But Bishop Williams, I say this at peace realistically. The only thing that should show up to church is Jesus. And I know for you deep folks, let me unravel that for you. Yes, you need to show up. But when you show up, bring him along with you. This, 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 there's not enough of him. Can we just surrender our hands in the atmosphere just for a brief moment? Those of you that are hurting, 
you, your anointing hasn't left you. You're just in such a state that you can't even tap into what's inside of you. Some of you that are in here realistically need to repent. You've done so much damage that repentance is the best way out. There's some of you right now in here that you, you, you recognize that you're at a crossroad. It's not a bad thing, but there's a moment when you're going to be moved forward. And it's going to take much of God to keep you where he's going to take you. I want you to all over this building just begin to open up your mouth and just begin to talk to him the way you, you would talk to him. Not, 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 not a format, not a systematic way, not, not anything conjured up or typed out in your mind, but just talk to him. Just speak into him. the atmosphere. It's been a while since you've actually talked to him in such a way because you're afraid that you will get in the way. I, I, can you just begin to speak to him? Just speak to him, speak to him. And if you're here tonight, we've got Bishop Williams. I know this man for 20 plus years and I know that there's a level of an anointing on his life and I've seen demons move under the anointing of God through this man's life. If you're here and there's a heavy struggle that is upon you, I want you to step out into this aisle and I want you to come down this way and I want you to just begin to believe that God is going to do something extraordinary on your life tonight beyond your expectation, beyond your imagination, beyond what you came here to receive tonight. I, 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 I know you're struggling. You know you're struggling. You know you're fighting. You know, you know, you know you're, you're even wrestling with the notion of whether or not you're still functioning in the capacity of God's plan. If you're here tonight, and I know you are here, come forward. Glory. As you stand on this altar tonight, David said this, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and delivered him out of all his trouble. Before the leaders come and they lay hands on you, I need you to open up that mouth of yours. There's life in your mouth. There's hope in your mouth. There's belief and strength in your mouth. That which you have inside of you, the devil has tried to silence you. But tonight in the name of Jesus Christ, of Nazareth, I declare it. Can't tell you the whole state. Release your, release your mind, release your spirit. Hallelujah.
for your purpose, for your will. In Jesus' name. Deliverance, God. 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 In the name of Jesus. Deliverance, God. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Jesus. If you're here, don't leave this room. is here don't play with your life you need to be up here glory to God 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 every believer in this house I want you to lift your hands lift your voice and begin to bless God begin to exalt him something is about to happen in your life and I want you to begin to bless him bless him bless him Bless him. Bless him. Bless him. Bless him. Bless him. Bless him. Your sister. Oh. Hallelujah. Listen. Listen. Bishop Williams, there is such a heaviness on your young daughter. Carrying a Lord. Too heavy. It's too heavy. And it's going to mess up your mind. It's going to create physical problems in your body. It's too heavy. Keto Shire. Ketana Rabahose. Katio Shire. Hold on a second. Can I get all the Williams? If you're a Williams child or daughter, I need you to come up here real quick. Come, yes, let's come around. My beloved in the purple hat, sweetheart, can you just take the young lady from Sister Nicole? Sister Nicole, I need to come. Bishop, I just want you to anoint your daughter. Just, just hold the music for a minute. When you think you can carry a load, you climb up and you hold it in. And our blood vessels are no different from a gasket. You hold things in long enough, over time, you will blow that vessel. Yes, sir. Overheating. 
you will create an issue in your system that will mess you up. You know as well as I do that there is a tremendous anointing on your life. But if the enemy can chop down a tree and create an environment where that tree will not grow, it will suffocate under its own roots. Hello, somebody. And the more you try to do, it's hard because you're suffocating under your own self. And then you create an internalized pressure within yourself that even if your, your sisters want to help you, you fight and you lash out against them. And all they're trying to do is help, but you can't see the help because it's too much. Yeah. Blind your eyes. My God from his glory. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm going to ask each one of your sisters. I'm going to ask them under the anointing that they possess and they carry. And what's unique about this, each one of them carry different giftings mm -hmm. that is going to release and pour into your spirit. And I would suggest tonight that what is about to happen in this room, I want everybody to, I want everybody to, I want e e e everybody to find somebody, grab a hold of somebody real quick. Good God Almighty. Yeah. Grab a hold of somebody real quick. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Glory to God. Thank you, Holy Ghost. There's a yoke that is about to be destroyed. Keto shot. Makianda Jose. It has been holding down the believer for a long time. But in the name of Jesus tonight. Keto Shaya. Hallelujah. The power of the Holy Ghost. Tonight. Keto shot. Holy Ghost. Is going to destroy that yoke.
better and him say 